Hello, everyone, and welcome to HIV Scotland, a live Q&A. We're absolutely delighted to be joined by the wonderful Mercy Shabemba, who's a member of the HIV Commission, among many, many roles that she has um, in the HIV movement, and delighted to be joined all the way from America by Bruce Richmond, who's one of the founders of Prevention Access Campaign, who started the U Equals U movement. I'm going to introduce them in a, a few seconds um, to the chat. If you have any questions or you want to make any comments, do comment on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube or Twitch. We're live on all four platforms um, this evening. Um, so do feel free to comment, um, send in your questions. We've got a couple of pre-submitted questions. We're going to be having a conversation about global activism um, um, and how we can really Take the take the movement forward beyond coronavirus. This is probably going to be the least coronavirus focused conversation that we have, uh, which I'm sure will be um, of great delight to many of you that are watching who have been watching some of our other Q and A's that seem to have focused more on uh, coronavirus than anything else. Um, so I'm delighted to welcome Mercy Shabemba and Bruce Richmond. Hi both. Hi. Hi Bruce. Hey, hey Mercy. Um, so I'll just um, start off by asking you um, both to sort of introduce yourself, what you what you get up to in the HIV movement. Perhaps we could start with you, Mercy. Yeah. Um, so I'm co-chair of a charity called the Sophia Forum, um, which focuses specifically on women living with and at risk of acquiring HIV. Um, and as Nathan's already alluded to, I'm also a member of the HIV Commission, um, which is really exciting as well. Um, and then I do a few other bits and bobs. So um, I'm currently working on an exciting research project that I can't say too much about, but it's exciting um, and just generally a uh, yeah a public speaker and yeah. I'm an excellent one at that and Bruce over to you. Oh we've we seem to have lost Bruce has jumped out at that moment. Let's try and get him back on in a second. Oh We'll, we'll bring Bruce back on when I see his camera loading. Um, what was that? Oh, hi, Bruce. You're there. Hey, did it did it go out for everyone? It just, or it, I think it just dropped out for us all, yeah. Okay, good. I, was worried. I mean, not good, but I was glad it's not just <laughs> my Wi-Fi. I'm, the Wi-Fi is a little spotty here. So um, did you just ask me to introduce myself? Yes, we did. Okay. I'm uh, Bruce Richmond. I'm the founding executive director of Prevention Access Campaign which launched the U Equals U movement, um, now in 101 countries with about 1,000 uh, U Equals U partners that are dedicated to getting the message of U Equals U out to all people living with HIV and to ensuring that people living with HIV have the treatment, the care, and the services to uh, benefit from U Equals U if they, if they choose. Thanks, Bruce. So there's a couple of... Um conversations to, to be had. I think, you know, one of the interesting things, Mercy, that you're involved in is the HIV Commission, and that has been set up to look at providing recommendations to the UK government about how to get to zero new transmissions um, for HIV in England. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that, what, what's what been involved in that process? And, um, yeah. yeah, so um, it's funny. So yesterday we had um, a four-hour Zoom call <laughs> you heard that right, four hours. Um, and we kind of went through a, a set of recommendations. We're trying to now get into the stage of, we've looked at all the evidence that we've been given. Um, so we traveled around the country. So we had community hearing events where anybody was able to come to that city and let us know what they thought would feed into um, arriving at the goal of no HIV transmissions within the UK or HIV related deaths. Um, but yes, it was really exciting and humbling actually till we've been given a look at all of the anecdotes, the stories, the experiences and say actually what, what are the themes that are coming out that are most important and what is it that will actually help us push to zero and I think you know sometimes you can kind of get not lost but lost in the numbers of like oh this is how many people are living with HIV but what does that actually mean and what does what does that mean what does that look like day to day so um there's been a really exciting process and i think it's really interesting because we've worked with uh, people from across 
different sectors, um, which is what we're going to need more of as we come closer to the goal. It can't just be that we work in silos. And Bruce, how important do you think the U equals U message will be um, for us getting reaching those global goals of, of zero HIV transmission, zero deaths, zero stigma? Uh, first, I just want to ask another technical question. Um, while Mercy was talking, did it go out again for you? It, sort it just of black flickered out. slightly. <laughs> okay, okay. It, it was significant here, but okay. Um, yeah, I mean, a U equals U is is extremely important. I mean, there's there's there there are many ways. I mean, first, it in terms of reducing stigma associated with, with HIV. When you reduce stigma associate, associated with HIV, people are more likely to get tested. Um, so that's sort of the, the you know the, the first ninety, and then um, and then you know when people living with HIV know that if they go on treatment and they become undetectable, they're not able to transmit HIV, that's, that's an additional incentive. So we not only stay healthy first and foremost, but we also can't transmit HIV. So that's another incentive for people to uh, adhere, initiate treatment, adhere to treatment, and stay engaged in care. It's a wholly new, new, uh, a new uh, benefit now that we, we know about. Um, and then, you know, what, what's really important and what I think a lot of um, advocates are, are still missing in, in, in advocacy, whether it's for treatment or, or uh, wraparound services or viral load uh, diagnostics, is, is that getting people to U equals U or getting people to undetectable, we know is, is, is so transformative for our well-being, for the people living with HIV, for our well-being, our, our, our mental health, our, our personal health outcomes, um, clearly. And I think that's, that's the argument that we've been advocating with for, for, you know, for decades. Now we have a second argument. We have what, what's called the public health argument for, for, uh, for uh, treatment, care, and services. So now we can say we need treatment and care and the services. We need to remove the barriers to treatment, not only for our health, but to stop new transmissions, which will get us towards ending the epidemic. Um, so now we're seeing policies changing that are enabling more people to get on treatment and to get into care. Um, it, not just again for health, but for prevention, which is what a lot of policymakers care about. They care about prevention and unfortunately often don't care about our lives. So we need to address their interests in prevention with the U equals U public health argument. I think that's really interesting and important as well, because you do see a lot of campaigns around zero HIV transmissions, and that's that prevention argument. But ultimately, um, until there, you know, unless there is a cure found, there's still going to be people living with HIV that we want to live long, healthy, happy lives, you know, with a good quality of life. So it's, those are, I think, the, the key bit components as well to any global mission to get to zero transmissions. We have to be making sure we're looking after people that are living with HIV as well. Yeah, the fourth, that's the fourth 90 that people talk about is that yeah. is a quality of life. It's, it, it, you know, it's, it's so important. And we know that U equals U has really transformed quality of life for so many people living with HIV. We need to make sure that that's accessible to everyone. Mercy, in terms of some of uh, any global work that you've been involved in, what do you think the comparator from England um, or the UK to other places um, in the world would would be. Do we think? Do you think we're we're ahead of the curve here, or do you think we um, have much more to do? I think, in a lot of senses, it all ties back. When I think about this, it all ties back to the NHS. We have a safety net that many other countries do not have. We we'll always know that actually, my access to treatment is something that I don't need to worry about. And that is kind of is kind of the bedrock of how things look because if you don't have access to treatment, if you don't have good treatment programs, you're gonna not get very far in your HIV response as a nation. Um, and that's something that I found time and time again, you know, you can have all these nice fluffy things, but if people can't get their medicine, then we're, we're nowhere near where we need to be. And Bruce, you work with the Prevention Access Campaign in, in, in so many countries like you talked about. What do you think 
What, what is the global sort of position at the moment in terms of these global goals of reaching zero transmissions, zero deaths by 2030? Is there still a long way to go? Is that achievable in, in a global setting? I, I, I think it is achievable. And I think it's, it's really um, relies very, you know, strongly on what, what Mercy was talking about is, is, is access to treatment and to, and to changing policies. Like for instance, policies like in, in Japan, I was just in, in Japan um, working with advocates because to try to, you know, working to change the health ministry's policy that um, people with HIV will only get free treatment if their CD4 count drops below 500. And so that means there are people living with HIV who are declining in health and we're hoping they decline in health so they can get to 500 so they can get to treatment. So these, you know, these, these progression to 90, 90, 90, or in the fourth 90 really, really depends on policies and programs, um, really good programs to support people living with HIV. In the United States, you might be shocked to hear that in one of the richest countries in the world um, with some of the highest numbers of people living with HIV in the world, 1.1 million, we only have half of those people on treatment and in care. So we have, you know, half of the population of people living with HIV, you know, most of them are declining in health and progressing to an AIDS diagnosis. And so, um, you know, we, we're not gonna reach 90, 90, 90, unless we focus on the, you know, the, 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 the half of those people, about 450,000 people. If we, we're not gonna get to 90, 90, 90, unless we're focusing on their well being. You know, and, 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 and that's not just treatment. Treatment is available. There are excellent programs, but it's getting access to treatment and dealing with all the wraparound services, the social determinants of health and the structural problems, the racism, the transphobia, the, the homophobia uh, that's making, you know, that, that are really barriers to, to treatment. So it really depends on, you know, on the country. And I mean, we see incredible work um, in, in, in other places that I hope that will import uh, into the United States, like your program, Nathan, <laughs> like your, uh, your your coaching program for HIV Scotland is, it's incredible. It's incredible. We need that kind of program in the U.S. to help people living with HIV. We need a lot of a lot more services to connect people with HIV to community um, and and to feel uh, that they can navigate their lives in a healthy way with uh, with HIV. And Bruce, you, you talked about 1990. I think it's maybe useful. You know, some people watching might not quite understand what that means, or they've heard it and think it's quite jargonizing, as it were. You know, that so 1990 is a UN AIDS um, initiative um, that was was set up in order for countries to have some targets to get towards testing and access to treatment and people being virally suppressed. So the level of um, HIV in someone's body being undetectable um, and that's 90% of people being tested and diagnosed for HIV of which the UK floats above 90 just just um, around 91 92% of people living with HIV across the UK um, are diagnosed the second 90 being accessing treatment and the UK does pretty well there um, around you know above 95% um, and then the third 90 being people being virally suppressed again if you've got people accessing treatment then thankfully because of all the treatments that are available you can have a high percentage of people being virally suppressed as well that fourth 90 that you talked about Bruce obviously is the quality of life um, of people that is much more than a medical model of healthcare, and um, which I think is really important Mercy on I, think can I just jump in yeah, yeah. I I was actually having a really interesting conversation about the 1990s targets and particularly to the UK ones. And it'd be really interesting to strip it down to what are the 1990s for key populations in the UK, because I think that would reveal a, a lot that would be really interesting to dig into. But yeah. Yeah, no, I think, I think you're right. What I was going to um, ask you was about, you know, that first, 90 and we know you know in scotland there we estimate around 500 people living with hiv that don't know they have it because they've not been tested and not been been diagnosed and that i think is is one of the problems you know everywhere is the fear of just accessing a test and what do you think 
um, activists and activism and advocacy organizations and individuals can do to to really break through that stigma that exists in order to get to get tested yeah i wish i had the answer to this i mean don't we all i think um it is just about finding really innovative ways to do it i remember being at university and they would sexual health nurses would do testing in clubs um, and I just remember thinking that's such a perfect example of actually a, a good public health model that is willing to meet people where they're at. And I think um, as we get you know, to smaller and smaller numbers in the UK, we're going to have to find new ways to go after those that we've not been able to you know, successfully engage with. And I think it is about looking at how do we actually get into communities and how do we make this something that is on their radar and not something that they should avoid. And, you know, it, it is about constantly dr drumming, you know, home the fact that it could be anybody and that getting tested shouldn't be a one-time thing as well. It should be a frequent thing. Um, I think a lot of people say, oh, it's something that I did in the past, but actually it needs to be something that happens regularly. So. And Mercy, I think what you said as well just before about, you know, the key populations, the populations of people that are most likely to be affected by HIV. So, mm -hmm. you know, in Glasgow, we're, we're seeing an ongoing outbreak of HIV among people who use drugs. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been going on for, you know, five or, or nearly six years. Um, and it's, that's been a massive challenge. One of the questions I wanted to put to you, Bruce, was... The, with the U equals U message only at the moment relating to sexual transmission, how effective is that message getting through to different populations um, who might be might be transmitting HIV in other in other ways? And is it the? I guess what's my question because it's one that comes up quite a lot because of this because of that big in Glasgow. How do we get that message um, and re reduce that stigma whilst there is other transmission routes um, still still happening? No, I'll just you need to un unmute. Uh, yeah. okay. I was just saying that you know that's a, that's the really difficult early days of the campaign was um, this doesn't apply to people who inject drugs. Uh, because it's not a route of transmission through um, needle sharing. And at that very time that we were getting kind of criticized for that, which was always helpful, we like feedback. Um, the only clinic that had served um, Scott County, Indiana, which is where there was the largest outbreak from sharing needles from, from injection drug use, um, was going out with the t-shirts telling people who inject drugs U equals you because they have sex. They have sex as well. And so it's really important to tell them. But sometimes in the field, there, the, there's this pushback um, that this doesn't apply to breastfeeding or this doesn't apply to injection drug use. Well, it applies to sex and a lot of people have sex. And we just have to make it clear that this is just about sex. You know, and there needs to be more research on breastfeeding. There should be more research on injection drug use as well. We need to be really honest to women um, and and um, uh, about uh, the you know the, the very very small risk of breastfeeding and uh, let let women make decisions for themselves about breast or chest feeding. I should say as well. Um, and I think there's a tendency to be paternalistic and try to make decisions. Uh, uh, for people living with HIV, especially marginalized communities. So people who inject drugs and women um, need to need to know about it as, as well. And, and, and the pushback is only gonna, gonna hurt them and everyone if, uh, if, if the, the information isn't, isn't shared. It is one of the things that I remember seeing a post of yours, Bruce, on online when you were ready to take the US government to court about the uh, because the right of access to information was they were withholding information that was that was useful to people living with HIV and well not just people living with HIV you know the the world um and I, I remember when 
HV Scotland released our you know poster campaign trying to get across that U equals U message in very plain English. Um, and some drug services asked for the posters that we had and hearing then some people complain because that information was really dangerous to people who use drugs be because it's not injecting equipment, um, not covered by injecting equipment, but feeling that same thing, which was, well, they're still having sex. You know, in, in the population in Glasgow, it's a high use of injecting cocaine, which results in a higher sex drive than, you know, your heroin or, or whatever. And, and it was about that sort of, well, this is, people have that right to information. And uh, I think I'm glad, in, I'm glad in saying, Bruce, that you didn't have to take the US, the, the US to court, did you? No, I mean, and surprisingly, the federal government, not the top levels of the administration, the, the evil administration, uh, but, but the, you know, the CDC, NIAD, Dr. Fauci, um, you know, they were really, a pleasure to work with. I mean, we had to threaten, of course, as activists do. We had to, you know, I yelled once and um, I swore once and I apologized. But uh, but over the course of a year of conversations, they, they updated the risk and, and made history. Um, but it was more folks who, you know, who work in the field that were really challenging us um, and, and saying exactly what you were saying, you know, Nathan, is that this doesn't apply to this population. I remember um, a transgender leader said, this doesn't apply to my girls because they have too much else to worry about mm -hmm. and we're not gonna tell them. And so then, you know, transgender women that we work with and have been advocates since the very beginning said, this is one less thing to worry about and fought back. And we all deserve to have know this information. So that paternalism um, was rampant rampant even through the community and clinics you know doctors of course are going to be you know paternalistic but it was it was it's very interesting to have someone withhold this from their own community of people living with hiv it was very surprising um but fortunately they're you know most we're past that you know um, we're in a much better place now we often hear stories of people reflecting about the moment that they heard about you equals you, not just heard about it, but actually started to believe it. Um, Mercy, do you remember what you felt when you heard and understood what you equals you meant and how what, what how did it make you feel? Um, I, I definitely remember being told about it um, and it was a very hush-hush thing. So it was before, before I was ever an activist and before... I knew about any of this, but I, I remember being told and I was just kind of told in a way of like, don't really tell anybody that I've told you this information, but I'm kind of going to give it to you. And I just felt kind of a bit confused because obviously now it's this massive thing to be celebrated. But when I was told it wasn't a liberating or empowering thing, it was kind of, yeah, here's this piece of information that I'm myself aren't really sure what to do with um but have fun and i guess it's a slight weight off your shoulders um so yeah it's definitely interesting i was with somebody in january of this year um when they found out and i was like as happy as i was for them i was like we're the same age and you've just found out like in 2020 and that's my issue with the, this whole conversation that it's it's been a very difficult one to grapple in terms of who has power and who has knowledge and how do we as a community reclaim that and yeah <laughs> and how do you think you know I, I've, I've seen Bruce talk several times and he always brings up examples of the UK um, and the campaigns that have been run by whatever organization but we always hear stories of people and one of the questions that we we got actually um, in was around you know gay men who use grinder or different apps that um, still to this day put that they're on prep rather than that they're living with HIV and undetectable because of the 
the stigma and I guess it's how do we is the U equals U message getting through to people who is putting the barriers up and not letting that information get through to people um, and what do we need to do in order to make what could be quite a complex medical message which automatically puts barriers up about you know who is in who is able to understand that information um how how do we get it so that there's not clinicians that are saying oh this is this is an, a bit of information that i'm i'm willing to give you but maybe not willing to give other people as well are you asking me or Marissa? I was putting it out to the to the air. So <laughs> <laughs> if you want to answer first, Bruce, then do. You know, it's funny. I mean, so it's basically, do, you know, how do we get clinicians to stop kind of cherry picking who gets the information and who doesn't? Yeah. I mean, that's the reason that I got involved in this in the beginning is because, you know, I learned in 2012 and I'm very privileged and connected to the medical establishment or had a really good doctor who was. And then I would talk to heads of clinics, H, you know, people living with HIV who were very prominent in the field. And they were um, saying, you know, we don't share this with everyone. It's a hundred, like, like Mercy was saying, you know, we believe it, it's a hundred percent true, but we don't share it because people won't understand it. Um, or there's a rise of STD, STIs already, and we don't want a further rise. So this, again, paternalism, and it was really, it was really focused on people of color, you know, low on, low income folks, um, people who enjoy telling you about, um, and it, or, you know, it was it was really the information was being. Oh no! Oh no! We've had a dropout again from from Bruce and, and his and strike. Yeah. Okay, um, and I go. think that the way that you get this with doctors with clinicians there's there's several strategies that we talk about um, one is uh, it's just unethical it's unethical to withhold this information to people living with HIV or to exaggerate the risk from someone with HIV and that in the United States that's malpractice and so we talk when we talk about malpractice clinicians get a little bit worried um, because you're telling someone something you're giving them advice that is 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 against industry standard. First of all, it's not it's against the, the the medical guidelines in the United States, and it's harmful to them, and that's malpractice. And then the other thing that you say that's also really helpful and addresses their self interest is your patients are going to find out elsewhere, and they're going to know you lied to them or you withheld this from them, and that's going to break trust between patient and provider which is a really important thing. Trust is really important for people to stay engaged in care and to feel safe. You know, if you can't appeal to the doctor's, you know, interest in helping their patients all across the board um, with personal, their, their personal health outcomes, you know, you would deal, you, you, you kind of have to play to their, their self-interest. Um, you could also talk to them about this is, you know, this is a public health issue. You'll be contributing to prevention if you if you tell everybody across the board. It's hard to deal with their racism or their homophobia. That's like decades to try to undo, but you can come up with strategies that will will get them to take to change their mind. And the final one I should say also, sorry, going along, is peer pressure. Uh, if you get another doctor to talk to them, um, you know, or the medical associations to talk to them. That's another thing that we've we've been able to do, um, you know. That's and there's there's been a lot of progress in that and on that front, uh, especially the guidelines in the U.S. being updated, the treatment guidelines, including U equals U in, in guidelines, is is a you know a, a big deal. I think as well for me, it's about the power of the peer. Um, coming at it from a young person's perspective, I I know what it is firsthand to grow up knowing you've got this virus that has historically been known um, for being really infectious and really stigmatizing. And I think that's why a lot of young people struggle to wrap their heads around it because you've grown up with this idea that, okay, I can't, I can't like touch anybody. And then suddenly, you know, coming of age happens and it's like, 
oh no, like you're fine, like go do what you know. Um, you you can you can be a mum. You you can have sexual partners. You can do all these things. And I think for me, what's been helpful is having peers that are older than me and being able to be like, oh, actually no, they went to university. I can go to university. Oh, actually they're a parent. I can be a parent. Oh no, they're married. I can be married. And it's. I think it's just about continuing to work on the image that people have in their heads about what it is to be someone living with HIV. And I, it's similar to you equals you, but I, um, I, I've got a sister and my sister's HIV negative. So for me, I've always known that there, there, there has to be a way that, you know, it's untransmittable. Um, but she's my favorite example when people just don't like, well, same set of parents and so yeah I think that point you made Mercy about knowledge being power is really um is really like powerful in, in itself as a as a statement I remember going to a school of 13 that to a class of 13 year olds to talk about HIV um just ahead of World AIDS Day a couple of years ago when I started working for HIV Scotland and hearing them talk about HIV in such a knowledgeable way as 13 year olds because their teacher had it was something that the teacher was really passionate about in educating kids so that you could reduce stigma and the only thing that came up that was sort of not true that they just believed was that when women living with HIV could give birth to HIV negative babies and that was the only bit of sort of um Mis misinformation that they just couldn't get their heads around that and that was 13 year olds yeah. um who knew everything else they knew that you couldn't pass hiv on if you were you know on treat all of these things and i was just really proud then a just a couple of years ago that scotland has started to put in u equals u prep hiv information into the curriculum in scotland for young people because knowledge is power and that's the only way that we can we can get, you know, have the new generation of teachers and clinicians that grow up learning about U equals U in school. They don't need a CPD module online to learn about it. They learn about it when they were training and, and, and growing up, which I think is really is really powerful. Bruce, Maybe we had one pose a question to you. Of course. <laughs> um so obviously HIV Scotland has launched this new kind of opportunity and I think particularly linking it to coronavirus and how obviously we're on lockdown da, da, da. Um, how have you found the experience and how has it helped you to think more about breaking down barriers to get people to test so you talk, uh, uh, you're talking about HIV self-test Scotland uh, and yeah so we yeah we worked with Waverly Care to set that up on the basis that We've got uh, a, we've got people at home, one so captive audience, uh, quite literally. Um, but the amount of testing that happened across Scotland had plummeted, you know, to close to zero levels um, each week. And really, for for us, and and I sort of went to Waverly Care with the idea and said, why don't we just do this? We've been talking about a national self testing program in Scotland since i've been at hiv scotland um i chaired a working group that recommended that two and a half years ago and the buck has been passed from pillar to post with you know is a national model right is a regional model right and i think i was just getting sick of that being passed around when we do have a unique opportunity it's not the best opportunity for everyone to test right now and i think we need to get that messaging right is that for many people, right now is not a good time to test because they don't have their support networks that they can go to. Um, they could be in a very unsuitable housing situation or um, alone. And some people will not want to or shouldn't have to deal with getting HIV diagnosis if they're on their own and they can't access their support mechanisms. But for many people, now is a great time to test because they'll have perhaps not had any risk factors, not had sex with people for a few months. So a test now is pretty accurate given the window period. And I think that for me was the reason why 
we wanted to just do something and feel like we'd done something in this time. Because for HIV Scotland as an organisation, we've never historically been a service provider. Um, so doing policy work during coronavirus has been a bit sort of a bit odd in that, you know, if I go to clinicians and try and engage them in a bit of policy work at the moment, they're like, dude, I'm coronavirus, <laughs> like, get away. And I think we had to just reflect on that and be like, right, but we do have a role. What we do is is, is important. Um, and that shift, you know, Bruce mentioned the life coaching stuff, which we set up to try and provide people with a bit of a different option that wasn't, you know, counselling works for people, but it also doesn't work for some people. Um, so it's it was always about where are the gaps and where can we do some innovation and create creative thinking about filling those gaps. And we just... We've done loads of work about thinking what are the gaps. And it was just, I, I told my team at the start of this, try everything, even the most insane, you know, off the wall ideas, try them. And if they fail, blame coronavirus and we've not lost anything. You know, like you, you the, just try things. And if it doesn't work, then fine. It's yeah. unlikely to have cost us that much money because it's not like we're booking out a venue and doing a big launch. Or, you know, we're, we're coming online to have these excellent conversations about new ideas or new thinking. Try it. And if it doesn't work, then that that was coronavirus's fault. It wasn't our fault. Um, and and that, that, I think, with HIV testing was that that thing was it could fail and that's fine. But we got a little bit of money um, and we were like, let's just do this. And we worked with some great creative people to develop a service. Mm -hmm. um, and it was it was it was fun to do that so quickly. Mm -hmm. And everyone, everyone that worked on it had the same mission, which was let's get a service that people can test now. Mm -hmm. We don't need to wait a year. Let's get it now. Um, and that was what I think was most most fun about it. And now. You know, it launched on Friday. We've sent out 175 tests in four in four and a half days, um, and hopefully that number will just grow and grow and grow. But the the other important bit about that that I was really heartened to hear was the African Health Project um, saying that something like this that normalised testing and wasn't promoted to at risk communities because that was one of the things that we wanted to make sure we didn't do. We weren't saying you have to meet these criteria in order to get a test. We've just said, here is how you can get HIV. If you think you might have been at risk of HIV, it's best to know, like know your status. It doesn't matter who you are, where you live, get a test. And that normalization of it, um, I think will help to reduce that stigma and that fear of a, di of a diagnosis or what it means to, to be living with HIV. And hopefully that will come across. And now I can't remember what question I was. Oh, I was going to pose your question, Bruce. Um, one of the questions we had submitted um, was, it, it's quite funny to think about the time period because it was only five years ago that in Scotland, all people living with HIV could get access to treatment because of the partner study that withdrew that um, sort of wait until your CD4 count is um, reduced. And at the time, um, we called it treatment as prevention. Um, so this question from someone was, given that people know what treatment is and what prevention is, why did we add the word undetectable into the mix? And is it potentially confusing for some people? Well, um, it's treatment as prevention is refers to uh, treatment's ability to reduce transmission. Um, it doesn't say the level of viral load that you need to get to, and it doesn't say the extent to which treatment prevents transmission. So it was really important for us to come up with a phrase that was clear that you need to get to undetectable. And that, that's what you're, you know, prescriptive. You need to get to undetectable. And then descriptive, the, the, the level of um, 
of transmission is untransmittable. So it's it's clear it's dis, it's more descriptive. We had to get that way because otherwise people would think um, that if they're on treat, all, all they need to do is be on treatment and they're and they're untransmittable. Some people are on treatment and they have low level viremia, which means they have low levels of virus in their blood and it might not be below 200, which is the threshold for the, you know, the kind of the um, overall of, of the studies. Um, if you're uh, under 200, you're untransmittable. Um, so we have to make it clear that it's not just being on treatment, but it's actually getting to undetectable while on treatment and, and staying undetectable by, by continuing to take your medications and, and, and staying in care. Is that also, the other thing is TASP, right? Treatment as prevention. It's a really important term, and it was it was coined by Julio Montana in two thousand and seven. But you don't see people tattooing TASP on their body. It's like U equals U. We're seeing it all over the world. People are tattooing it. They have the U equals U T-shirts, and it's become a you know U equals U masks now. And so it's become something that's very empowering for people with HIV. And it's in so it's in almost. Probably it's probably about 50 languages at this point, um, and it translates very well. The U equals U to B equals B in Turkey, or um, M equals M in the, the the kind of oldest indigenous tribe in Venezuela. It's uh, translated to M equals M, and I equals I in Brazil, and S equals S and um, and Zambia. It's it's so many H equals H in Russia. So it's it was important to get to that kind of phrase that. At least to people with HIV and people in the field, it makes it makes sense and it's and it's clear. Mercy, I was just thinking. Um, so today I chaired a meeting of the Young Leaders Network, which is a bunch of um, young chief executives, and and I've decided because of coronavirus that I'm postponing my thirtieth birthday this year. Um, so I'll be twenty nine. I'll be twenty nine for another year. Um, but one of the I think major problems that a lot of the sector has sometimes is reaching young people um, with some of our messaging campaigns involving young people as activists. And they're often the most inspiring and most creative and most innovative. Um, so I wonder if you can um, provide some insight and in how do we, as a, as a wider sector, involve young people and make make the sector relevant to them um, so that we can create that new new wave of activism that that will break many more glass ceilings than we we can currently do i think um so i was thinking about the international aids conference this year and how it's obviously going to be online and i think one of the ways in which we can tap into engaging with young people is by utilizing those kind of things and um, i think definitely we have a long way to go in how we use social media to tap into what young activists can do um, in in the movement but for me i've always felt that i've been I've been really lucky to be given opportunities that are probably too big for me, but people believe in me. And I think my challenge to anybody that, you know, holds the keys to those opportunities is how have you involved a young person um, and how, how will you continue to involve young people? And I think it's also about, you know, young rascals like you, Nathan, and, <laughs> um, you know, being in those positions and actually, um, making it a possibility, but also showing people the way I've always found you to be really open and um, transparent and you're, you're really approachable. So I think it's about facilitating those conversations amongst young people ourselves and thinking about actually what can we do to be more involved in a meaningful way. Um, so it's not really an answer, but if you're old and you're watching this, include young people. And if you're young, get involved. <laughs> I think that's that's absolutely important. You know, I I often I'm not sure I would consider myself young, even though I, in the grand scheme of things, I guess I am. But I did just learn how I just learned how to use TikTok recently, so perhaps uh, <laughs> we might see HRE Scotland on TikTok. 
um, in in a fun way. Bruce, did you did you just say you you are young? You are young. You are young. And I don't know how to. I can't figure out TikTok, so I am old. <laughs> That's a clear sign. Um, and and you, Mercy, I, I couldn't agree with you more about uh, young people. We have um, young people on our uh, uh, of our ambassadors and steering committee who are I just go to them all the time for for advice and to make sure that that we're um, really serving uh, the you know, younger populations, not just in the US, but um, in all other parts of the world too. So we've had a question come through on Twitter. Um, how can modern media be used? I think so quite relevant, I think, actually, to what we just talked about. How can modern media be used to make HIV information or content accessible for everyday people? So one of the uh, whilst I let you two think about a question, one of the um, things that we did recently was host the live in lockdown um, show, and one of the ways I wanted to when I had a, a vision about this mammoth four and a half hour um, online show during lockdown, I went to a bunch of drag queens and I said, please, can you say these things? So talk about you equals you talk about testing and we've got a bunch of clips now of lots of well-known drag queens talking about these things um that i think you know drag is is one form it's not it's never going to meet everyone's uh, everyone's needs or whatever but it's one form of getting a message out to people that some people will will listen to um and reach an, an audience that perhaps organizations can't reach um online so that was one of my things that that used sort of our new media to to do that but mercy over to yeah, you i think so for me uh in the past i got the chance to um speak to television um like tv writers on casualty um about involving a story and they they did they wrote it in and i watched the episode and it was great and i think it's about finding ways to meet the public where they're at so um not always being like, oh, do you know what? We're, we're going to do this campaign and everybody's going to look at it and we're going to put it on billboards and all this stuff. But actually, what do everyday people come into contact with and how can we tap into that and use that as a form to just weave it in as a story? Because I think the danger with big campaigns and all of that is that it doesn't help to normalize it. Because if it's so, if, if you just kind of encounter a HIV message, in something that you would encounter every day. I think that helps to normalize it and just make it a part of normal life and what you discuss and what you talk about. And I think particularly after this, you know, this epidemic is, this pandemic is over. Um, I think this has really made people wake up to the fact that public health is everybody's issue and that it isn't, oh, that's, that's something I don't need to worry about. But actually, how can we use this kind of feeling of health is really important and central to everything that happens in life um, to be able to, you know, normalise HIV and other things. And then the message was on a big Netflix um, series, wasn't it, Bruce? Yeah, on, on Elite, which I loved and I was obsessed with all three seasons and also Designated Survivor, which I'm just watching now. And I think that, you know, getting it into popular culture is really important. I think, you know, the, in the, in the again, coming back to the UK, you did a phenomenal job, Nathan, with Live from Lockdown. I watched, I, I was, watched every minute of it. Was it like three hours? I couldn't even. Four and a half. Four and a half. I couldn't pull my eyes away. It was so done, done really well. And then also, like, if you look at Terrence Higgins Trust, working with Gareth Thomas, getting, you know, Gareth Thomas out all over the media that made, you know, global media and, and Biva, you know, Chloe Orkin's, Chloe Orkin's interview was, you know, was like historic with him. And um, then you're just seeing people just come out and talk about U equals U and HIV, like in the US, uh, Jonathan Van Ness, who is from uh, Queer Eye for the, the Straight Guy. Um, what is that what it's called? Jesus. That's what it's called, right? I can't believe I'm such a... <laughs> Ah, queer eye for the straight guy. Um, so, and and and, I, and I, what I think is really important is is that some of the larger agencies, again, like like Terrence Higgins Trust, are using their communications firms to reach out to the media. You know, and I I, I think in the U.S. we we really want some of these big agencies to get together 
and hire a PR firm to promote, you know, U equals U and just living with HIV, normalizing it for the general public. Because we, we have really great PrEP campaigns in the US and, and that's important and we celebrate those and we have a national PrEP campaign, but we also really need to focus on destigmatizing HIV, you know, and, and, um, and, and, and you know, in a strategic way, like we see Terrence Higgins Trust doing in, in England, you know, we can learn a lot from uh, from them and from from you, Nathan. I mean, that was just spectacular what you did. So I think we're we're, we're coming towards the the end of of our discussion. It's been uh, really good to to chat to you in, in this format, uh, as in the many ways that we've both uh, we've all um, had conversations. But I guess one of the things that um, I've been thinking about recently and using these Q&As to try and think about, you know, different ideas or different um, messages. And we we had Professor Sharon Lewin on uh, talking about a, Q, a HIV cure, which was honestly one of the most fascinating discussions I've ever had with anyone. Um, and I would definitely recommend going going and watching it on our YouTube channel. Everything that we're trying to do is, is make people either think in a different way or think about something that they might not have thought about before. And for for me also, I mean, this conversation was to try and get people to think about activism and being involved and advocacy and, and using, using a voice where, you know, whilst recognizing the privilege that it takes to use a voice a lot of the time in some of this work. So what would your message be to someone that's watching this at home who is someone living with HIV, there's someone that's on PrEP, there's someone that has a friend that's living with HIV, regardless of, of who they are, but um, that wants to get, in, get involved and really help spread the message of, of U equals U or testing or help end stigma what would your what would your message be to to them um that might tip the balance from them sitting at home and not doing anything and then actually get getting involved and in, and in helping us change the world um, i don't ask small questions <laughs> yeah. well I, I would say in addition to telling everyone you know, you equals you, everybody you know. And if you don't know how, or you're struggling with ways to say it, come to our website, preventionaccess.org to learn. And I'd say this is really important because this is still new, as I said earlier, and I can't stress this enough, is that to use the public health argument of you equals you, to increase access to treatment and remove barriers to treatment, not just treatment, but treatment uh, services and, and, and for the well-being of people living with HIV to save our lives and prevent new transmissions. Investing in the well-being of people living with HIV is essential for ending the epidemic. We have to connect those two in our advocacy. And that's a, our, our top priority, a prevention access campaign, to make sure that gets across and to use whatever privilege and access that we have um, to make sure that U equals U is a revolution that includes everyone. And I think for me, it would be, you know, HIV is a really unique thing in the sense that a lot of the progress that has been made has been community led or community driven. Um, and use this current crisis to kind of instigate you think about the health inequalities that this has opened your eyes up to um, the, the scandal that you know this whole testing fiasco has been and actually you you know harness what you're feeling to actually navigate what that looks like for you in getting involved in something bigger than yourself and joining a great community <laughs> Well, thanks both um, for your, your time to, to Mercy and Bruce. It's been a great conversation and I'm sure there'll be, um, there's been many people watching it over this hour, but I'm sure there'll be many people watching it over the coming weeks. Next week, um, we'll be joined by an absolute star, James Bush, who was the um, pilot living with HIV, who fought the law and won um, in partnership with HIV Scotland and BuzzFeed journalist Patrick Strudwick. So we're going to be talking about that successful campaign that not only changed the law in Scotland, but is changing the law across Europe as well. So join us 
next Wednesday at 7 p.m. for that conversation. From me, Mercy and Bruce, goodbye. Bye. Thanks for having me.